I guess it's, I'm standing here because the camera is pointed in this direction. Yeah. So I'd rather be just sitting in the middle in between everybody. Um. Does this stool make it look like I'm sitting at the kids' table? Yes. <laughs> so it's at, it's like around this point of the week where I start, um, I start getting sick of hearing myself speak. Or I start getting sick of the things that I'm <laughs> saying. So I, anyway. Um, so I'm going to give a, I'm giving a talk and it's really a talk. Uh, I was on Twitter this morning, and so my talk is, is partly related to wait. Do I need to be speaking directly into this thing? Yeah. Um, this talk is a continuation of the talk I gave last summer, which, to refresh people's memories, was Propositions for a Poetics of Post-Memory. A lot of that was just thinking about how to, how to connect with our ancestors, but also it wasn't, it wasn't necessarily defining what an ancestor is or what the ancestors are. Um, it was connecting to this thing. It was really a way to connect to ourselves in a certain way. Uh, so this is a continuation of that. And I was on Twitter this morning and somebody who I follow just tweeted, I think in relation to everything, leave the ancestors alone. And I thought, oh, I should just not give this talk. Because <laughs> that's not what I, I don't, I don't leave them alone. And I, even that little, like, even that little moment on Twitter made me feel really, it reminded me that I should feel, um, not that I should feel bad for what I'm doing, but, but that I should, I should uh, be more respectful of, the ancestors, because um, a lot of the work I'm, I'm doing or trying to do is like forming some kind of respect for the past, forming some relationship of respect for history, for memory, and then uh, something will remind me that maybe I'm not I'm not working hard enough to do that. Um, I'm not I didn't I didn't revise my talk based on that tweet. But um, I'm just throwing that out there that um, even I gave a reading last night at the Japanese American Museum and was thinking, uh, yeah, to what extent am I, am I um, bothering the ancestors? And to what extent is my process a process of violation? So that's kind of prefatory. Another disclaimer is that the end of this talk, I'm going to be reading something that I read last night. There, there were a few of you that were there last night, so I apologize. You're going to hear some of the same thing again, but it's, it's in a different context this time, slightly different context. Um, so, yeah, I'm just going to read it. I don't have any visual aids or, or things like that, so I hope everybody's taking notes. If there's anything salient worth writing down, I don't know. Um, so this is a this is a talk on a a place. It's also a talk on a process that is meaningful to me. Um, it can be viewed as a, a coping mechanism. It can be viewed as a a, a place um, of connection, of a variety of things. So we'll just I'll, I'll just throw that out there. Um, So hypno hypnagogic writing, the last, the last thing I'll say is I try to uh, come up with talks that are ways to articulate things I've been thinking about. Maybe that's obvious, but it's not. Um, what I'm, what I'm going to talk about is something that I've been doing and thinking about for a long time, but I've never actually written down. So this was just an occasion to write it down. So I refer to it as notes. It's a talk, but it's, it's really um, me trying to think through something that I haven't actually articulated yet. I want to preface this talk by saying that I believe that a significant amount of our suffering 
our physical and psychological and spiritual suffering, but also our social and cultural and collective suffering, is due to the fact that the suffering of those who have come before us has gone, for the most part, unaddressed and unrelieved. And that we are the inheritors of the immeasurable accumulation, therefore the immeasurable burden of that suffering. So it would stand the reason that it would be very difficult to stand at all under the weight of such a burden, and that to stand at all is not only a feat but an act of resistance, part will, part coping mechanism, part magic, and yet an act of resistance that, resistance that paradoxically contributes to the burden. In other words, I believe in my more despairing moments that it is very likely that our suffering, despite our acts of resistance, will go unaddressed and unrelieved in our lifetime and in all lifetimes, in my more despairing moments. At least, I feel this is true as long as there are forces that serve to separate us from the sources of our suffering. In other, other words, unless we commit ourselves to connecting with these sources, so what I'm going to describe in this talk is a, a space, what I, what, I, what I feel is a hopeful space, a space that exists parallel to the space that is made by unaddressed and unrelieved suffering, a space in which we might be able to connect with the sources of that suffering, including the suffering of those who came before us, as well as the source of our creativity. I call this space, I just. Personally, I refer to this space in my mind as the subterranean spring. When I say, when I say that, that phrase, the subterranean spring, what, what comes to people's minds? Is an image created? Everything. The sub, yeah. The subterranean spring. Yeah. Why is it unnameable? Yeah. I did a fountain. Water. <laughs> the subterranean spring. Yeah. Underground. Underground. There's this quote by uh, Augustus Spees, who was a fought for the eight hour work day, and he talked about like a subterranean fire. Something right here, subterranean. He fought for the eight hour work day? Yeah, it was built in Chicago by Oh, oh yeah. Subterranean fire. Yeah. yeah. Um, yes, yes. In so, uh, Olympia, I get my water from an Archimedean well. And uh, I thought of that. And a lot of times when I'm collecting water, I think about how the water is in a very deep underground, mm. in a totally dark space for a really long time. Yeah. Before it comes out of the Yeah. Do you think about that when you drink it? Often. Yeah. 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 That's nice. <laughs> the end. Just kidding. Subterranean spring is a region in our minds that is often inaccessible, or feels inaccessible, yet flows through our consciousness. Not only does it flow through our consciousness, but it connects to and flows through the consciousness of others. Ancestors, for example. People bound by solidarity, atrocity, fate. The subterranean spring is therefore a region of our minds where we might visit and communicate with our ancestors and where we might disinter in collaboration with them subjugated voices, repressed memories, and unrealized energy. And importantly, the subterranean spring is a region in our minds into which we are permitted entrance through a ritual act, in our case, writing. So this is kind of like similar to what Alejandro said. Think of the water table that flows beneath a dry riverbed. In Tucson, where I live, the bed of the Santa Cruz River is, except during monsoons, completely dry and has been dry for almost a century. But the river itself still flows it flows hundreds of feet below the riverbed. 
And though you would think hundreds of feet is an irretrievable distance, every time it rains, it only takes a few drops of water before the river, hundreds of feet below, is activated and starts rising to the surface. Just a few drops of water. It's just, wait, it's just waiting for that moment of connection. The subterranean spring flows in the hypnagogic realm. How many people are familiar with hypnagogia, that term? So hypnagogia is a state of consciousness between being awake and having fallen asleep. From the Greek hypnos, sleep, and agagos, leading into. Hypnagogia is induced in the transition between alpha wave, or conscious brain activity, and theta wave, or subconscious brain activity. It would seem that this transitional state between being awake and having fallen asleep is prohibitively narrow. It reminds me of something Lee Young Lee wrote in his memoir, The Winged Seed, which is a beautiful book. I know you wonder how a hand may enter a place so narrow as a seed. The answer is the hand must die. One of the first mentions of hypnagogia in literature is by the third century Greek philosopher Iamblichus in his book, The Mysteries of the Egyptians. Iamblichus writes about the voices that come to us as we are falling asleep. The voices, he writes, comes, come from spirits that cannot be perceived by sight, but by another co-sensation and intelligence. I'd never heard that word before, co-sensation. 1,500 years. <laughs> Sorry, I just yeah. hit me in a good way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 1,500 years later, Edgar Allan Poe wrote about hypnagogia. But whereas Iamblichus focused on voices, Poe focuses on images, which he refers to as the shadows of shadows that arise in the soul, where the confines of the waking world blend with those of the world of dreams. He refers to the hypnagogic state as a point, and that the challenge is to maintain ourselves in that point without falling asleep, and that if we do, we might be able to behold and remember, and therefore transfer the shadows of shadows into the realm of memory where they can then be accessed and returned to, translated and transcribed and made permanent. I taught a class this fall at the Poetry Center in Tucson on the poetics of post-memory, which is basically just an extension of the talk I gave here in the summer. The subtitle of the class was About Our Ancestors. I had 16 students, half of whom were 70 years old or older. All of my students came to the class with the intention of writing about their ancestors, some of them with the hope of actually communicating with them directly, speaking with them, asking them questions, receiving answers. The first assignment I gave them was this. Every night for one week, write in a notebook as you are falling asleep. Not just in bed, but as you are falling asleep. First, think about the person to whom you wish to connect. Um, one of my students, this 80-year-old theater director, said, I don't want to think about a person. I want to think about a canyon. So I said, that's great. That'll be your ancestor. Um, think about that person or that place. Call them into your mind. After a minute or so, start writing. Write until you start falling asleep. But even then, keep writing. Write as far into falling asleep as you can. Don't worry about whether or not your writing is legible. The first night will be the most difficult, but if you keep doing it, you will find yourself able to write further and further into the hypnagogic state. All of my students did this every night for one week. A week later, we talked about their experience. Some of them said they fell asleep too fast. Some of them said they did not fall asleep at all, that the writing kept them awake. Some of them wrote poetry, some of them wrote lists. Some of it was completely illegible. Some of them said that once they were in bed about to fall asleep, they decided they did not want to talk ab about their ancestors or think about their ancestors. 
so they thought about something else. But here is something I both did and did not expect. Four of my students, all of them female, said that once they began to fall asleep and began to write, that they were visited by a person and that that person spoke to them directly. All four of the women said that this person was a female ancestor, although not necessarily the ancestor they had been thinking about. And all four of the women said that what their female ancestor shared with them was that they had suffered some form of violence. The nature of the violence was different for each ancestor, whether coming from within the family system or from a larger, more indeterminate force. What each of the ancestors shared, however, is that no one would listen to them. And this is something the ancestor apparently communicated directly. And that they were, therefore, still suffering. Having heard this, all four of my students, all of whom had been very eager to communicate with their ancestors, said that they were not sure they wanted to continue. We talked about this. We talked about whether or not cutting off communication with these ancestors was a way of perpetuating the silence by which the ancestors had been trapped and in which the suffering continued. We talked about whether or not we had any responsibility to our ancestors at all, especially in situations in which it is clear that we have been chosen by them to bear their trauma. We talked about whether or not our ancestors' trauma is also our own. We talked, therefore, about what it might mean to be chosen and what we might do about being chosen, and if there is a difference between being chosen and being the one who chooses. Daniel Four, F-O-O-R, in his book Ancestral Medicine, talks about the imperative of establishing boundaries between ourselves and the dead, so as not to invite harmful forces into our lives. Establishing healthy boundaries for rights can prevent energetic intrusion from the troubled dead, as well as enable you to de decline an invitation from the loving ancestors to merge with them. And he makes the distinction between loving ancestors and the troubled dead. And one of the, one of the ways he, he makes that distinction is by saying, loving ancestors are evolved and evolving, and the troubled dead are static and stuck. He suggests maintaining an emotionally neutral witness state. My students and I talked about transgenerational trauma. In addition to my four students who had been visited by their female ancestors, all, of my, all 16 of my students told stories about their ancestors having suffered some form of violence. Some of the violence was physical, some was psychological, some of the violence destroyed families, communities, separated people from the language of their mothers and grandmothers. And all of my students felt that they had inherited that suffering, that the suffering had gone unaddressed and unrelieved is what made it so present in their lives. In Shinto, the concept of musubi, M-U-S-U-B-I, refers to the energy that everything in the universe possesses and by which everything in the universe is bound. Musubi includes the energy that connects the living and the dead. The energy that exists is never spent or dispelled, but is transmitted and converted into other forms. My students and I also talked about how incredible it was that it only took one night and mere seconds for ancestors to appear. Ancestors with whom my students had never communicated and whom they rarely, if ever, even thought about. It suggested to us that the ancestors are not only present but waiting and that they are waiting just barely beneath the surface of waking life. Not all of my students were visited by ancestors bearing trauma. Some of my students said that while they were falling asleep, their writing began to change and that they became aware of the fact that they were writing in another voice or a voice they didn't recognize as their own. Not all of them could pinpoint to whom or what the voice belonged. My students read what they wrote. What they read was extraordinary, indefinable, lucid, unrestrained, and utterly distinct from the writing 
they were otherwise producing in class. So how to account for this? My students began producing writing that was, though not another language, a derangement of language, a derangement of their language, as well as a restoration of language, which is also a return to an original relationship with language. Our original relationship with language when we were very young was one of impulse and instinct, sound and experiment. It was a creative relationship. Cognition is creativity. In this way, poetry came before everything else. We were poets first because we were inventing language, or at least our relationship to it. And we were very close by nature to the subterranean spring. We occupied a point on the wheel of life nearly overlapping with that of the dead. Maybe that is what hypnagogia permits, a return to the infancy of our relationship with language, which was then, as it should be now, a synthesis of invention with an understanding that invention requires the contribution of thousands of generations. So I want to introduce into this evidence of an actual practice. I worked this past semester with Joanna Kaufman. We talked, who's our student? <laughs> not, so, not some other Joanna, but Joanna sitting right there. We talked during last residency, I think, about hypnagogic writing. I don't know if we use that word, but we talked about writing while falling asleep, right? Um, so Joanna decided that you decided that you were going to incorporate some of that into your semester. Uh, about a month ago, I asked Joanna some questions about that practice, um, which I'm going to ask her again now. So Joanna, can you explain and describe what happens to you when you write while falling asleep? 